Hello everyone, I'm Connor, and today I'll be discussing the solution to the Yusuko Silver January 2023 problem one. In this problem, we are given two strings. One is an input string and one is an output string. And we want to find the uh, minimum number of changes required, where if you change one letter, in you can change all appearances of one letter into another letter. So for instance, uh, in this sample input here, we want to change A, B, C, D into A, C, C, B. And the way you can do this is by cha first changing all the Bs into Cs. There's only one B. So that gives us A, C, C, D. And then we can change the D into the B. So that turns into our desired output string of A, C, C, B. To solve this problem, let's first try to get the cases that are impossible out of the way. In the problem, we're given uh, one case that uh, is shown to be impossible, that being this case right here. So let's see why this is impossible. We want to try and turn one of the Bs into As, and we want to keep the other B into a B. The issue here is that our operation only lets us change all appearances of one character at a time. So if we want to try and change this B into an A, it would also change this other B into an A. So we can't have them both correspond to different characters. Let's see if we can find any other cases that are impossible. Let's look at this uh, case where we have A, B, C, D turned into B, A, C, D. To do this in the sample solution, they had us uh, turn one of the characters like B into A, E, C, D. And then we then turn this into B, E, C, D. And then we can turn the E back into an A. As you can see, this kind of required an extraneous character since E wasn't in the original string. And we had to kind of use that because if we tried and turned uh, A directly into B, then that would mean that now these two Bs are the same character. So we arrive in the same situation as in the impossible initial impossible case where we can't turn one character or we can't turn the same character into two, two different characters. So that tells us that we do, in fact, need this extra character here. Um, and this is true in any case where there's a cycle, a cycle being that we have one character that turns into another character, another character that turns it back into the original character, or maybe something like a loop of three, where if we have A, B, and C, B, C, and A, uh, then we have to have A turn into B, B turn into C, C turn into A. And if we try and do any of this directly, like for instance, turn B into C, then we'll have two characters that are the same, but we need them to be different. So we have to use a spell, we have to use an extra character like D in this case. So this kind of leads us to another case that might be impossible. And that's when we have this kind of cycle with 52 characters. So we have A, B, C, D all the way to Z, and then capital A to capital Z. And then we turn that into like B, C, D, all the way to Z, A to capital Z. And then we have A at the end. So this cycle has 52 letters in it. So that means that we can't turn any letter into uh, any other letter in the set. However, this time we can't use any extra characters outside of the set because uh, we only have these 52 letters to work with. So that means that this is actually an impossible case simply because we can't possibly uh, turn the first string into the next string. You may have noticed that I use the terminology of cycle, which usually comes from graph theory. And that's for a very important reason. And that's that I claim that this problem is essentially a graph problem in disguise. To see why, let's look at this sample input here, where we want to turn A, C, B, E, D into B, B, C, A, D. So in order to do this, we have to turn every we have to turn this A into a B, we have to turn this C into a B, this B into a C, this E into an A, and this D can stay as a D. So we notice that we don't actually have to care like about the orders of the letters or anything. We only really care about what the letter eventually turns into. So this A turns into B, et cetera. So that means we can kind of represent this as a graph. If we take each of these letters to be one of the nodes, like A is a node, B is a node, C is a node, D is a node, and E is a node. 
And then we can draw the edges between the notes as uh, the letters that need to be turned into each other. So for instance, A has to be turned into B, uh, C has to be turned into B, B has to turn into C, uh, E has to turn into A, and D can stay above. So that's a self loop. A very important property of this graph is that every node has at most one edge coming out of it. And this is because if, let's say we had a node that had more than one edge, like let's say E went to A and E went to C, then if we looked at what this would mean in the original stream, then that would mean we have a, E turn into A and E turning into C. But this means we would have two of the same letter turning into two different things. And this is the case that we said is impossible earlier. So therefore, it's also impossible in this case. So we can't have any node that has more than one outgoing edge. Let's see what this graph means in terms of the original problem. So in this case, we have to turn E into A, A into B, B into C, or uh, C into B, and D into itself. So this means that we can kind of look at these connections as instructions. Like we want to turn E into A eventually, and we want to turn E into B eventually, etc. However, we have to be careful about the order we do these instructions in, because say we turn E into A before we turn A into B. That means that we want to do nothing else to this E, which is now an A, but we need to eventually turn A's into B's, which means if we execute this instruction by turning A's into B's, then that means that E's will be turned into B's as well, which is not what we want. So this gives us an idea that the graph kind of tells us of an ordering to do these instructions in. We never want to instruct, or we want never want to execute an instruction that happens uh, before an instruction later down the line. So for instance, we always want to convert A's into B's before we convert E's into A's. However, this arises in an issue when we look at cycles, such as this one between B and C. Uh, we can't turn B into C directly, and we can't turn C into B directly because that would lead us to our uh, issue of having the same character. We have to use that extra character trick that we talked about earlier. Remember that our ultimate goal is to minimize the number of instructions we have to do. So for instance, we have to perform all of these arrows at least once, except for the D going back on itself. And we want to minimize the number of extraneous in, uh, instructions. That means we want to avoid trying to use an extra character whenever possible. So let's see what are the cases when we can't avoid using an extra character. As it turns out, we only might need to use an extra character whenever there is a cycle in the graph. For instance, if we have this A to B here, which corresponds to the string AB turning into BA, then we have to use an extra character here. Like for instance, we have to turn A into E, then B into A, and then E into B. And that solves our problem of having the instructions kind of be in the wrong order. And on the second cycle, for instance, we can turn A into something like Q, and then uh, B into C into A, then B into C, then Q into B. And that also gives us a valid order. However, note that every time we do this kind of uh, special character shuffle, uh, we have to use an extra instruction. The graph only shows us that two instructions are required, but we have to use an extra one here, uh, one to go from A to E, one to go from B to A, and then one from E to B. Similarly here, we only see three arrows here, so we should, we might only need to use three instructions, but using our extra character gives us four. And as it turns out, there, there are special cases when you don't actually have to use an extra instruction when there's a cycle. So let's look at one of the examples of this. So in this case, we have A going to B, B going to A, and C going to B, which corresponds to turning the string ABC into BAB. We see that there's a cycle here, so we might want to go for the uh, extra character approach, in which case we can turn A into something like D, B into A, and then D into B, and then C into B, because we need to also turn C into B. And this corresponds to this sequence of strings. Uh, and we have to do four instructions for this. But actually, there is a better way. We can, instead, avoid using this extra character by turning A directly into C, then C, in, then B into A, and then C into B. 
So C kind of acts as our special character because it allows us to turn A into B kind of indirectly. So that corresponds to this set of instructions. And we can see that this is one instruction shorter, which means we want to always do this whenever possible. So when is it possible? Well, it turns out the only case where we can't do something like this is when we have something I call a pure cycle, where the only nodes in the graph are in the cycle, or the only nodes in this component. There might be other components like D turning into E or something. But in this component of the graph, we only have A turning into V, turning into C, turning into A. So we have to use this extra character. Anytime there's anything else pointing into this graph, like for example, we had F pointing into C, then we're able to do, do this trick by turning B into F instead. And note that we can find whether a cycle is uh, a pure cycle programmatically by looking to see at the in degree. The in degree is the number of edges that go into that node. Like for instance, in here, C has an in degree of two because B has an edge going to C and F has an edge going to C. We know a cycle is going to be a pure cycle if there's only one, if every node in the cycle has an in degree of one. This means that only the previous node in the cycle has an edge leading into this current node. And anytime we have an in degree of two or more, that means that there is an edge leading into the cycle, which means we can use that to do this trick here. A very important thing to note when you're implementing this is that you don't actually care what characters turn into what, because we already know the input string and output string, and the answer we need to provide is the number of transformations that happen. And the what actually happens is irrelevant. This means that when we're computing our answer, we can kind of just pretend that we did all this work and just secretly like count the number of uh, the number of replacements that we actually have to do. And we don't have to worry about what replacements we actually do. So let's take a look at an example here. We have this input string, and we want to turn it into this output string. And this corresponds to this graph. And there are a couple of details here before we start with our solution that I want to note about making this graph. First of all, uh, we have two occurrences of B to C here, and that will just correspond to one edge because we don't have to have any multiple edges in here. And additionally, we note that I never appears in input string, therefore it has no outgoing edge. First of all, notice that we can kind of, we have three components here, A, B, C, D, F, G, and H, I. And we can kind of treat these individually just because if we try and change between uh, only characters within this uh, component, for instance, then that won't affect any other characters because uh, they're disjoint sets. So let's look at the components one by one. Let's start with this ABC component here. We note that this is a pure cycle, and it's a pure cycle that has three elements in it. Therefore, it's going to take us a minimum of four instructions to change between these because we have to use an extra character at some point. So we can say there are four instructions in this component. Next, we can look at this component, where you have to turn G into F into D into E and E into D. We have this cycle here at the end, but we also have this node F, which has a which lets us have an in degree of greater than one. And this in degree means that we don't actually have to spend an extra instruction on this cycle. So that means that since there are no other cycles, and in fact, there can't actually be any other cycles, um, we have exactly four instructions needed to turn uh, all the letters within this component uh, to their final output. So since there's four instructions in here, that gives us a total of four for this case. And finally, for our last case here, it's pretty simple. We don't even have a cycle. So we can just simply convert H into I, and that gives us a total of one instruction for that one. So adding these up, we get a total of nine. So our general course of action for our code is first we're going to check over these impossible cases, since these impossible cases to, could lead to invalid graphs. Then uh, once we're done that, we are going to loop through, look for each of these components, and we can use this with a simple uh, iterative search. 
or recursion or whatever you really like. And then once you find the components, see if it's made up of a cycle. If it has a cycle, then check to see if it's a pure cycle. If it's a pure cycle, then you have to add one to the your final answer. Otherwise, you can just simply take the number of instructions and uh, add that to your total answer. Um, and then you can run that for each component, check to see if it's a pure cycle or not, um, and then use the instruction counts from those. Note that pure cycles, uh, you can just take the number of instructions and add one extra. So let's look at my code for this problem. First of all, I read in our input. Uh, this input is given with multiple test cases. So I simply loop through them, read in the two strings, and run and call this solve function, and then print that out. This solve function is fairly long. Um, it returns our integer answer, and it contains all the stuff that deals with each test case. So first thing I do is I simply check to see if the strings are equal. And if they are, then you just return 0 because you have nothing to do. We already know that they're equal, so we don't have to do anything. Then I do some simple fills here uh, because these are arrays I'm going to use in the solution. So I need to reset them to their previous values after each test case. I also include a helper variable here where n is s1.length, which should be equal to s2.length. Uh, I think they had to guarantee them the problem. So here I keep a set of distinct integers. And one thing to notice is I convert all of these characters into integers because uh, if we look at the character values, uh, we have lowercase a to lowercase z and uppercase a to uppercase z. So uh, it's much better to normalize these to just the integers 0 through 51 so that we can just store them uh, all right next to each other in an array and we don't have to worry about looping over them weirdly. So that's why I made this helper function here called from character. It checks to see if c is lowercase. If it is, then we return 26 plus c minus a. So if we take this, then that will turn uh, lowercase a into 26, lowercase b into 27, et cetera, up to lowercase z, which would be 51. And if it's not lowercase, then we return c minus capital A. So this means capital A is 0, capital B is 1, all the way up to capital Z is 25. So I keep this set of distinct integers, and these integers are just what represents the character values. And this set is necessary because of that special 52 uh, letter case that I mentioned at the start. If we have a cycle and uh, it's a pure cycle and we can't actually, uh, we can't turn it into anything else, there is no extra character to use, um, then it's, we actually know it's impossible. So in the loop, I uh, insert every two character, which is essentially just uh, for each index, I check to see what the character is coming from and what the character is going to. And I insert that into the distinct set. And I check down here to see if there's 52 characters in this set. Uh, and if there is, then I return negative one. Because the only case in which this actually works is if the strings are already equal. And we already checked for that case. So now inside this loop, uh, I have this if loop check. And this CMAP array is essentially what checks to see uh, which caret goes to what. So since uh, in our graph, we know that each character can only have at most one uh, one other character that it leads to, then we have this just array that kind of represents the edges between the characters. I have them default set to be negative one. And that means that it doesn't lead to any character. Otherwise, it'll lead to a value from 0 to 51, depending on what a character corresponds to. And in here, I do our other impossible case check, which is to see if uh, two characters lead to different, or one character leads to two different values. So essentially, if a character, uh, it, if the character map is already set, but it's not equal to our current two character, that means we must have two different characters that, uh, that are being uh, led to from one character. So that means we can return negative one immediately because this case is impossible. And in this case here, we just check to see if the uh, character map is not set. And if it's not set, that means that we have a new edge. 
So this puts in the new uh, edge. I also keep an in-degree array here. This just keeps track of the in-degree of every node or every character. So uh, we take in uh, the two character here, and then we increment our in-degree because we know there's a new edge leading from from to two. And here's our distinct check. And here's our answer array, which keeps track of our answer. <laughs> so here, uh, I do a pretty simple check. If we have any self loops, or like we did in that D in that example, then we know we don't have to do anything with the character. So we just set the character map to negative one uh, as if there was, was no edge. And this prevents us from making some mistakes, like accidentally thinking there's an extra cycle. So down here in this for loop here is where most of our operations happen. So this is what checks to see whether something, whether a component leads to a cycle or not. Since it's difficult to kind of tell actually what components are, um, we have this loop here. And this is kind of like a depth first search sort of. But the interesting thing about this is it doesn't actually matter where we start in a component. Say, for instance, we had a case kind of like this, where we have x leading to a, leading to b, leading to some other stuff. Then our search is always going to look at a first, and then it'll, it won't know that there is anything over here with x until it reaches x. So I'm going to build my uh, searching function in a way that allows it to deal with cases like these. So first of all, uh, we do this visit check. And this visit array just stores whether we visit a, a character or not, because we don't want to revisit characters, because that would lead to having extra instructions, which is what we don't want. And we also check to see if i is going nowhere, because we don't want to bother with letters that don't have any outgoing edges. So now in here, I keep an array called cycle. And this cycle is what contains the current component that we're looking at, not just necessarily the cycle. And I keep a couple of other variables in here. This is pure, uh, keeps track of whether the current cycle is pure. Um, and this ci is just a copy of i, because we're going to be changing the value of i as we go through our search. And we want to keep the for loop the same. So now we have a loop here. And this loop is essentially just navigating this component. And what this loop does is it starts at some letter and it essentially follows these edges until it can't anymore. So if it starts here at A, then it'll go to B, then it'll go to C, then D, then E, then F, because that's where it points. And then it'll loop back to C. And since it loops back to C, it knows that we are in a cycle. So that means that, um, that, means that we're able to do the stuff that checks to see if it's a pure cycle and such. Note that we don't visit some of these components like G and H over here, and those will have to be visited in a later cycle. So now let's look at our uh, searching function. First thing we do inside here is we check to see if the character map leads to negative one. That means that we've reached the edge, end of the path, kind of, and we have nothing more to do. So we just break, break out of the while loop. Now we keep this is cycle boolean, and this is cycle is used for this for loop. And this is where we check to see if we've hit a node that we've already hit in the cycle. Like in that last example, this is where we check to see if we hit a C again. So we loop through all of the elements in the current cycle. And then we check to see if our current node is inside that cycle. That mean, If it is, then we know we've found a cycle. And here's where we check to see if it's pure. This is pure variable is going to be maintained down here. And if it is pure, then we have to add an extra uh, an extra number to our answer because then we have to use an extra character. And once we find that cycle, then we just break out of this for loop. And if it is a cycle, we break out of the while loop. So um, essentially, this is our entire cycle checking thing. We basically check to see if we've already, if we return to a node we've already visited within this search. And then if it is a cycle, we check to see if it's pure. If it's pure, then we add one to our answer. Otherwise, we just break because it doesn't change our answer. And after that, uh, we do a simple chat here to see if we've already visited this node. Uh, if we have, then we just break because we don't want to revisit components. Like in that last example, 
since we've already visited uh, B here, if we start from G, then we don't want to continue going around the cycle and think there's an extra one. So that means we set each one time to visit in. If we set B to visit in, then if we start here and we go here, we check to see that it's visited and we can just immediately stop. So that's what these two lines of code are doing. They're just checking to see if we've already visited. If not, then we can continue on and we set it to visit in now. And here we just add this current node to the cycle and we add one to our answer because we know we must have traversed one edge to get to this cycle. So that means that we have one more additional instruction here. Um, and here's where we check to see if something is pure. Remember that we maintain this in degree array by checking to see if whenever we add an edge, we then we add one to the in degree of the uh, of the end node. So we check to see here if the in degree is greater than one. And if it is, then we set is pure to false. And this kind of works, kind of works naively because even if uh, the edge isn't part of the cycle, we know that if it eventually leads to a cycle, then there's also going to be in degree of two here. So in this case, we have B and C both have in degree of two, which is greater than one. But if we start from A, then as soon as we hit B, then we know it's not going to be pure. And if we continue along here, we end up in this cycle, and we know it's not pure. And even though it's set because of B, we also know there must be a node C because there must have been some way we entered in the cycle. If we have a pure cycle, like uh, the triangle from A, B, and C, then we know that it's always going to be pure because if there were some other way leading to the node and some this way made the in degree have two, be at least two, then we know that this is not actually a pure cycle. So that's pretty much it for a function here. The only thing left we do is we set this uh, current index to the next edge. So this is just going to the next node in the search. And once we've done that, uh, we know that we're done with this current component, sort of. So then we move on to the next iteration of this for loop. And this for loop just does this for every character. So that means that it won't miss any of the components. And once this for loop is done, we know that we've counted all of the possible answers. Uh, so that means that we can just return. And this code, note that this code doesn't actually tell like which characters are turning into which. Uh, it just knows that whenever it sees an edge, then we have to add one to the instruction. And whenever it finds the pure cycle, we also have to add one to the instruction. So yeah, so that's the solution to this problem. Uh, it's a very tricky string problem that's just got, that's actually a graph problem. So yeah, thanks for watching.